We are in for more surprises. The next one has to do with the viscosity of liquid helium. When a normal liquid flows through a tube, it will resist the flow. In this experiment, we shall cause some glycerin to flow through a tube under its own weight. The top layer is colored glycerin. The liquid layer closest to the tube wall adheres to it. The layer next in from the one touching the wall flows by it and is retarded as it flows due to the interatomic, the van der Waals force of attraction. The second layer, in turn, drags on the third and so on inward from the wall, producing fluid friction or viscosity. The narrower the tube, the slower the liquid's rate of flow through it under a given head of pressure. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Many capillary channels run through this ceramic disc. Their diameter is quite small, about one micron, which is one ten thousandth of a centimeter. There is liquid helium in the beaker. It is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Helium-1, the normal phase. The capillaries in the disc are fine enough to prevent the liquid now in the beaker from flowing through under its own weight. Clearly, helium-1 is viscous. To be sure, its viscosity is very small. That's why we had to choose extremely fine capillaries to demonstrate it. Here you see the lambda point transition. The helium-2 all pours out. The rate of pouring would not be noticeably slower if the porosity were made yet finer. We call this kind of flow a superflow. The temperature is now at 1.6 degrees. The superflow is even faster. The viscosity of helium-2 in this experiment is so small that it has not been possible to find a value for it. It is less than the experimental uncertainty incurred in attempts to measure it. We now believe that helium-2, the superfluid, has zero viscosity, although we should be more precise here. We believe its viscosity is zero when observing capillary flow. Bear this statement in mind, for we will come up with a contradiction to it in the next experiment, where we will look for viscosity by a different method. There is a copper cylinder in the liquid helium, so mounted that we can turn it about a vertical axis. In order to turn it smoothly, and with as little vibration as possible, we make the cylinder into the armature of a simple induction motor energized from outside the doer. The four horizontal coils you see provide the torque which turns the cylinder. The liquid helium is electrically non-conducting. The coils exert no torque on it directly. Yet, as we turn on our motor, the liquid layer bounding the cylinder is dragged along by it. The boundary layer, in turn, drags on the next layer, and so on outward. Finally, a circulation shows up in the helium due to its own viscosity and the wooden paddle wheel is turned along. What we have just seen occurred in helium-1, the normal phase, at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. That is to say, this demonstration is consistent with our results for helium-1 by capillary flow. Helium-1 is viscous. Here you see the liquid cooled down and passing into the superfluid phase, helium-2. Let's turn on the motor. The paddle wheel starts again. What does this mean? First of all, let me emphasize that, like helium-1, helium-2 is also non-conducting in the electrical sense. 
In other words, the circulation in the experiment can only have been caused through viscous drag. So we conclude from the rotating cylinder observations that helium-2 is viscous, and from the method of capillary flow that it has zero viscosity. Our experimentation has come up with a paradox. No normal classical liquid is known to behave so inconsistently in capillary flow on the one hand and in bulk flow on the other. This state of affairs forces us to think of helium-2, the superfluid, not as a single, but as a dual liquid. It appears as if helium-2 had two separate and yet interpenetrating component liquids. We shall call one component normal. It is this component which we hold responsible for the appearance of viscosity below the lambda point in the rotating cylinder experiment. The normal component, as the name suggests, behaves like a normal liquid and therefore has viscosity. It is the one which the cylinder drags along as it turns. But the normal component cannot flow through the narrow channels of the ceramic disc because of its viscosity. The second component has zero viscosity and it's called the superfluid component. We think that it does not participate at all in the rotating cylinder experiment below the lambda point. It stays at rest. On the other hand, it can flow through channels of one micron diameter with the greatest of ease, encountering no resistance whatever, because it has no viscosity. As we'll see later, this flow is not impeded even when the capillary diameters are made far smaller than one micron. This thought construction is called the two-fluid model for liquid helium-2. Whether it is correct or not depends on further tests comparing the theory based on this model with experimental results.